Hi, so I just really wanted to actually try doing something different. This is not like a video essay, this is just like me rambling about androgyny and like gender in K-pop, specifically male K-pop groups. Like, I want to ramble about like gender, not, not even gender, just more so fluidity, how it happens accidentally. Uh, or intentionally. The bit about me is that I just love to be super weird about K-pop. I love to go to Google and t- type like a name of a K- K-pop group or an idol and then some super annoying like pseudo intellectual word and then just see what like comes up. Like one of my favorite favorites is this uh, one person who I'm not going to tag <laughs> who wrote like I think I wrote like postmodernism and exo to the search bar and they were telling about how in their mind like uh, exo portrays postmodernism and the ideals of postmodernism through uh, their social critique such as and then they wrote that uh, songs like call me baby and lotto uh, were like intentional postmodern critiques of capitalism <laughs> Uh, so I just enjoy like theory for the sake of it. I, I go kind of deep, but I also want to like highlight that this is just like hedonistic, uh, non-binary rambling. This is not like cultural analysis. It is somewhat, but it's, it's, it's really for fun. Overlapping of feminine and masculine. The male idols are made for young female gaze, which differs slightly from female gaze. Instead of embodying just an ideal partner in a sense, Uh, idols more so embody approachable masculinity, often straight up femininity. This is because binary genders are divided so early on in society that there exists a divide and often fear between them. So especially stuff like hypermasculinity is threatening to younger femme fans. Uh, It also, I think, reminds them of the strict sexist model of heteronormativity they are expected to take part of part in as women. So idols need to look familiar to younger women for the demographic to want to interact with them. Uh, this often means talking about stuff they like, often things connected to teen girl experience rather than teen boy experience, even sometimes looking more like their female friends than the boys in their class. This is one part why big hit managers restricted Jungkook's gym usage when he was younger. And this is majorly why Justin Bieber was so popular. All those things which made him so despised by a large portion of society, looking feminine, acting soft, made him really approachable. Uh, You could find some similarity between K-pop and BL, boys love media, Uh, since they're both media in which not only female desire, but also female experience is channeled through the male body. Since I don't know how many kind of know this, but boys love, especially like old Shonen Ai in the 70s, isn't about gay male experience, but about portraying romance, which girls were interested in without the patriarchal weight of, of heterosexuality. So the boundary of identity, sexuality becomes less clear. This is the main point I'm trying to highlight. K-pop is very non-binary, it's very abstract. It isn't about girls like boys, and that in itself sells. It's about so much more. It's about overlapping of feminine and masculine, in a way you can't see much in such a large, large scale. An example of this fluidity and what this centering of the female experience leads into. There's a huge collection of pictures on Pinterest of Felix from Stray Kids, photoshopped in skirts and even female bodies. There's clearly like a lot of love in these pictures. Often him portrayed as specific forms of femininity, him as this femme fatale, him as, him as this goth girl. Him clearly in clothes the author themselves would want to wear Pinterest edit culture is invasive or even disrespectful, you could argue that, but it's done by young girls, young kids, of, young kids often. It's not like, it's not like I didn't write BCS fanfiction about surviving a small town as a queer kid. 
I think identity forming is complicated and it's okay to do identity forming through your teen interests. These edits are a very clear embodiment of the way fans interact with and recognize themselves within their idol. We like to treat wanting to be someone and wanting to be with someone as mutually exclusive, but they actually rarely are. And it's so, so evident in this case. Felix clearly isn't just a parasocial boyfriend crush, always, or a favorite, a favorite idol superstar. He's sometimes sub subconsciously a feminine role model, uh, someone young girls aim to be. It's for the idol as well. It's a, it's a two-way street. The k format both demands and rewards femininity and androgyny. Almost all idols are more masculine during their trainer time than post-debut. It's interesting to see how, as their career progresses, most idols become more androgynous and embrace femininity more. I think the same can be seen in Western male performers with mostly female audiences, like Harry Styles. First time I saw that video of Felix, Reminded me of that small, that short trend at some point uh, of hyper masculine, often older men trying, trying drag for the first time. You could often in this video see this intense click in their brain when they looked in the mirror for the first time with the full makeup on. There was this sense of joy and freedom. It isn't because these men wanted to look like that but more so the absolutism of gender broke in their mind at that moment. It's this complete reframing of yourself through seeing yourself in the other. And like gender just genuinely is fun. If you interact with it honestly, confidently and in a chill way, it's so fun. It raises, it raises a lot of questions, not even in a trans way, just overall in the reclaiming and understanding of yourself. Failure of the hegemonic masculine. The foil to feminine idols being the most popular is, uh, of course, the very masculine idols rarely being that popular. I've, I've been thinking how interesting it is that while K-pop's target demographic has changed a lot in the past few years, uh, as BTS and Blackpink spread majorly to the West and companies started to prioritize not only the money whale core audience of very young girls, but also the other whale of global radio charts. And even though sexism is still very much much alive in the industry, maybe maybe even more so than before, performing hegemonic masculinity is still a hindrance to a male idol. Uh, take for example Stray Kids' Chang Bin. He's very much an example of a Western male ideal. Huge body, big guy, his presence on stage is very dominant and stable. It's very clearly like popular among male fans in many, but in popularity ranks he scores pretty low. He performs hegemonic masculinity in a patriarchal society and really well also. Yet among his, yet among his industry, his conforming to the binary, binary ideal is a hindrance. It's just an interesting thing. Androgynous idol as the Jesus hermaphrodite. This is the highly subjective, selfish, uh, mental illness uh, part of the essay. As if the okay, as as if the previous ones weren't already. So uh, I've been deeply obsessed with this interview of artist and historian Lea Devin, uh, where they discuss gender, especially non-binary gender, in pre-modern times. And more specifically, uh, this one, one part where they discuss the concept of the Jesus hermaphrodite. I'll, I'll just quote the whole thing. Uh, other thinkers in pre-modern Europe identified non-binary sex with angels and heaven. Adam and Eve and Jesus. Some of the most idealized figures in European history, the Jesus hermaphrodite, a way of depicting Jesus 
in the late Middle Ages and early Renaissance as a perfect balance of male and female traits. Tuck suggested that transgressing binary gender categories could lead to physical and spiritual transformation for humans. Uh, is one of the many examples of humanity's long relationship with connecting androgyny to divinity. There's multiple exam there's multiple multiple examples of this globally, but most of them exist outside European white Christian binary stru- binary structures. So I've never felt comfortable claiming them. But this one, but this one, this one's for me. It's kind of extra powerful because Christianity has most of the time being a tool and hard forcer of heteronormativity and the binary gender model. There's actually a lot of good discussion of that in the article as well. Uh, so it's very po- it's, so it's powerful to me how the divinity of non-binary literally pushes through everything. Relating this back to the topic of idols. Uh, idol culture has a strict dualism in it. An idol is two people. An idol is formed from two constructs. The reachable human persona to which you create a personal connection to. And the unreachable, unhuman entity on stage. It's interesting how K-pop is based around parasocial relationships. Uh, yet on the stage, the rules of a superstar performance come to life. I mean, at least to me, the best performance is one where I forget the creature on stage is human. It's show business. K-pop creates this this illusion uh, through highly trained, perfect performance, but also styling, which incorporates colored lenses, abnormal clothes you'd never wear on your day to day, or things which are or things which aren't clothes at all, hair coloring, body language with language which isn't human, and breaking the silhouettes, rules and norms of the gender binary. The most perfect idol on stage is non-binary. They don't perform ideal male or ideal woman, they perform superstar. Felix is a good example of this. He's extremely loved uh, in the parasocial sense, uh, because of the because he is hard up his sleeve and kind personality, but I think on stage, looking at how he is styled, his popularity majorly comes from his androgyny. Every time he hits the stage, the highlight is on his deep voice, contrasted to vivid feminine styling. They could style him hyper mask, make him this imposing male presence, yet they style him flashy and often femme, more femme than the other members. It's more powerful when he is embodying both, when he is a modern version of the Jesus Hermaphrodite.